Let's now try and fit that in to uh, studies which have emphasized that, that the law in action is different from the law in the books. Uh, in particular, there are two classic studies. One is an American one, Settlements Out of Court, or Settled Out of Court, by Lawrence Ross, published in Chicago in the 1970s. Uh, um, and then Hazel Gain, former head of University College London, wrote a book called Hard Bargaining from her studies at the University of Oxford with Don Harris in the 1970s and 80s. These are key books. And the thesis of, of Ross and Gain, but this is what Ross says, you can't understand uh, law simply by looking at law in the books. The black letter formal rules do not tell you how the system works. Instead, you've got to look at the law in action, the application of those rules in particular situations and the wider context. So these lectures, th th those books very much are concerned with the law in action and not the law in the books. The law in action... Uh, uh, Ross and Gain emphasize the personalities and opinions of people who are involved in the system. What's the claimant like? What's the defendant like? What judges, lawyers, paralegals? I'm going to be talking about that uh, um, in a week's time, a week today. I'm going to be talking about finding humanity in the law of tort. Uh, um, Seizing interviews that we've done in the past with, with practitioners and with others, uh, what, where do they find the human spirit, the human voice in the tort system? How are things changed and, and, and a, a personality of certain individuals accommodated within the tort system? I suppose the most important bit of advice you could give to somebody who was, was injured in a claim is to get an experienced lawyer um, on your side. And that's not always very easy to do because, as we saw last week, the law is being uh, uh, de-skilled in lots of ways. Personal injury cases are being sent down to paralegals, um, junior claims handlers, because the cost of leaving it in the hands of experienced lawyers is getting too high. So uh, in the past, um, we used to con contrast the experience of claimant lawyers and defendant lawyers. Claimant lawyers went to anybody in the high street. Defendant lawyers had repeat uh, caseload from insurers, so they were of greater expertise. Then the, the claimant lawyers became more and more expert and specialised, and now we see the, this whole system being de-skilled, costs being cut. Uh, so the personality, opinions, uh, and abilities, and that last point is about the abilities of people in the system, is, uh, is fundamental. I'll talk about more, than, uh, more about that next um, uh, Tuesday. Apart from the, that first point on the personalities and abilities of, of people involved in the system, there is sort of the usual bureaucracy which affects uh, the disposal of claims. Organisational pressures resulting from dealing with large numbers of cases in, in office environments. Um, again, uh, these firms monitor the efficiency of employees electronically. They uh, you will see when you get involved in, in, with an insurer that you know, they have close control over the number of files you deal with. They will know how quickly you deal with them, what value you have. They will set you targets. Um, if you don't meet some of those targets, you'll lose your job. Uh, uh, how cases are settled. I've heard stories you know, in Cardiff towards the end of the financial year. There's a rush to settlement in some firms. Why is that? Why is there a rush to settle? Why do they settle claims quickly and for less money than they otherwise could? Because the junior office uh, people involved in these claimant firms know there's an end of year bonus, depending upon the, the number of claims we get when we settle. We will, our bonus will be related to the amount of money we get in for the firm. The firm needs to get cash flow in. Uh, it needs some, what some of them had, 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 had in one particular firm, which was. Uh, um, uh, had to publicly account for his business for various reasons. They needed to get cash flow in at the end of the financial year. 
It was the financial year which dictated, dictated whether the claim gets settled or not, or for how much. So, there, so the bureaucracy of, of settling claims goes far beyond the actual merits of those claims. It depends upon many factors concerning the, the financial organization of the firm. Uh, the pleasure you get from closing a file. I, I, I still have some... I don't have too much paperwork coming over my office, but I, I can get pleasure from thinking, well, that's done, that file's satisfied, I can move that into the out tray. It's so much more pleasure if you talk to claimants, lawyers downtown, when you finally finish that very difficult file, you tie the ribbon around it, and you send it down to stores. You send it down, and you've got rid of that difficult file. There's a bureaucratic satisfaction in closing a file. All these things contribute to whether the claim gets settled early or late. The one I want to talk about for the rest of this lecture is the negotiation tactics. I did a particular study upon this just, uh, as you see, a couple of years ago I published something in Legal Studies. I just want to illustrate and summarize what I said there with regard to what affects the settlement of claims, what affects the law in action, uh, um, as opposed to the law in the books. The sort of I wanted to look at what tactics are used by, by claimant and defendant lawyers in settling claims which are not related to the merits of the claim as such, which are not related necessarily to findings of fault or full compensation. What sort of things would you do when you're litigating against the other side? What sort of tactics might you employ? And I've got a, a half a dozen of them I've, I've, I've abstracted here from... Uh, that, that, that particular article. And one of the important things that was mentioned was um, the need nowadays uh, uh, to secure a reputation, the need to establish yourself as not a soft touch. Maybe insurers had gone too far. They had gone too far, perhaps, by, as I explained to you last time, by paying up claims too readily by trying to capture the defendants or its claimants by, by, by making direct offers to them over the, over the lawyers' heads to, to offer them sums of money straight away, small sums of money to get rid of the claim because they feared the costs element. Uh, um, they uh, tried to uh, make pre-med med offers, I mentioned to you last time, making offers in advance of any medical evidence. Uh, and sure as it's been said, now I've got the message that, that they have been too easy as a soft touch. So insurance lawyers have been saying we should get the message out there that claimants just can't write a letter and expect a check in the post. We must get a message out there. They just can't try this on. Our reputation is important here. We must reassert that ourselves as gatekeepers of the system. We shouldn't be seen to be a soft touch. Sometimes, look at what the next quote is. Sometimes we'll contest a case even where you're sunk on liability because we're having too many claims from this particular firm. Look at that. You know, it's not about the individual merits of a particular claim from a particular claimant. No, no. There's been meetings of defendant firms saying we don't like this particular claimant firm. They are pushing claims too much, too readily, for dubious amounts and dodgy facts. We've got to make a stand against this. And irrespective of the particular claim that comes before us, even though we are sunk on liability, we'll still run a defence against this because we want to hit that particular firm. OK, we'll suffer in costs. We'll suffer in costs because of this case, but they'll suffer too. They'll run up a cost spell. And we'll hold out. And they could be damaged on this way too. So it's got nothing to do with the liability. It's the need to be shown that you're not a soft touch and this firm uh, against you is running too many claims, unmeritorious claims, and it's got to stop. Uh, from a claimant lawyer's point of view, uh, they sometimes will say, well, we litigate, and one of our tactics is to actually be formal in litigation sometimes because you've got to show you're prepared to go to trial. So many claimant lawyers are, are, are settlement lawyers. Uh, they don't have any punchline behind uh, their threats. That, some claimant lawyers therefore say, 
You've got to issue proceedings. You just can't settle everything before issue. They've got to take you seriously. So you're litigating to, for your reputation. You're litigating in order to show that you're a hard claimant lawyer. You are prepared to go to trial if absolutely necessary. Securing a reputation, then, is an important facet of bringing uh, a, 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 a claim. Irrespective of the merits of the claim, you're trying to secure your firm's reputation, the insurer's reputation. Uh, uh, when do you make the claim? Um, at what, what, what stage do you actually formally tell the other side? Um, there was a, a few quotes in, in my study uh, where, where, where defendants and claimants agreed the claimants are at an advantage. The claimants can get their house in order. They can actually do something. Um, well in advance of telling the other side. There's no need to tell the other side. You can delay making a claim. Choose your time when you make the claim. Um, it, it's, it's the claimant who can get everything neat, everything in order, and then there are strict, when you do make a claim, there are strict legal time limits on getting responses and so on. You can put pressure on the other side by delay making the claim, have, assembling all your relevant evidence, and then go, boom, here we are. Now, deal with that, because I'm ready and, and ready to go with it. You can do a lot of pre-trial work, and there can be financial advantages in doing that, without telling the other side effectively. You can delay making a claim. So the tactic of when you actually claim. Litigation as, as a whole can be described as, as, in many ways as a poker game, as a game of bluff. Um, and as that one quotation at the top there says, we're not all, like, you know, we're not all good at poker. Some of us are better at it than others. Some of us can bargain. Some of us can uh, uh, argue in the marketplace. Others of us are less good at it. Um, look, at the, look at the next quote. You're, not, you, you're, you're going to put a defense in and use it as a negotiating tool, even if you've got no intention of actually taking it to trial. You will argue things to negotiate, even though you know there's perhaps no substance in this at all. Even though we and our client may be aware that a case has no chance, the other side don't necessarily know that. Obviously, you've got to call their bluff by saying that you've got the strongest case possible that you would have won. You try and sell it to the claimant lawyers by saying, well, a bird in the hand is worth more than two in the bush. In other words, here's a low offer because we've got a really good defense. I should take the low offer if I were you bird in the hand is worth more than two in the bush. So they would say that even though it's a bluff. And it's for the claimant firm to call that bluff and to drive the case further in legal proceedings up towards trial or resolution. So the poker aspect of, of claims, the, the game of bluff, is not mentioned in any tall textbooks, but it is a game of bluff. It, litigation is a, is, a, is a gaming action. When would you make an offer? Who makes an offer? Who, who, who contacts whom? Uh, um, well, the traditional uh, 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 offer is, is, is made by a defendant. Claimants see it as positively their role not to respond. It's the defendant's role to settle the case, is the traditional view. The defendant makes the first offer. And the claimant, as, as this guy says, you don't get any response. You know your offer is right when the claimants start to communicate. So the traditional view is that it's the claimant who make, the defendant who makes the offer, and it's for the claimant to respond. Mind you, the claimant knows the bottom line. The claimant knows the value of his case better than the defense. The claimant knows the bottom line where, where for dependents, it's more of a guessing game. And because of that, says one defendant, I start to step my negotiations at an incredibly low figure. We saw quite a difference in view amongst defendants. Some defendants really did start extremely low. Other more experienced defendants, in some ways, would pitch their offers higher, more reasonable. Because they would, they would, but it's a matter of negotiation. It's a matter of a deal, isn't it? You know, it's like buying a house or it's like haggling in the marketplace. Where are you going to start with your offers? Um, 
Nowadays, there, is, there are more first offers being made by claimants for a variety of reasons. You look at this one person says, says to us, if we think there's going to be some contributing negligence arguments, then generally we would like to get in first. So we'll make an offer first and put the defendant on the back foot because our case might be a bit weaker. And so we'll start the ball rolling. So the whole tactic of who makes the offer and how much it is is vital to what the case gets settled at. This is not to do with the actual merits of the case, nothing to do with the extent of fault, nothing to do with the, the, the full value of damages. It's how good you are at bluff, how good it, you are at doing a deal. And look, look at this particular tactic. Some defendants make a damages and costs offer all in one. There's inherent conflicts in, in, in interest of lawyers uh, with their claimants. You know, you can imagine a defendant saying, here's a sum of money, you can divide this claimants up as you, uh, lawyers as you wish. You, you take whatever costs you want out of it and give the rest to the, your, your client. You can see that they, they try to divide the lawyer uh, and his client. Um, competitive or conciliatory. Um, what approach do you take if you're going to be in practice downtown? Are you going to um, be litigious, aggressive? Will all of you be a, a nice person? Avoid formalities? Fear trials, perhaps? I always seek to settle. Um, well, Hazel Gand, in uh, um, hard bargaining, one of the main points she put forward was the most successful lawyers she found were in those times, in the 1970s and 80s, trade union lawyers, experienced lawyers, specialist lawyers acting for claimants. Go to an experienced practicing practitioner with a trade union base. Because why? Because they are very aggressive, procedurally aggressive, they're very difficult. If defendants miss the, the, the time limits imposed by the court, they will automatically apply for default judgments. They will be very aggressive in procedurally in getting the evidence that they require. They will be nasty and horrible to you. Um, and as Gen's famous statement, if you want peace, prepare for war. A compromising strategy is not in the best interest. Or compromising claims. Um, that's a that was a controversial view at that time. I found that not entirely to be borne out in the studies I've done. Um, but Dan's argument is the more aggressive you are as a lawyer, the better your settlements will be. Uh, for example, um, everyone's overworked, everyone's understaffed, so what you should be doing is harry, the harry them, um, press them, it rattles them. It rattles the other side. Keep on to them. Annoy them. Keep pouring the, the, the pressure on. Harry and, and pursue. Be aggressive. Sort them out. Keep on top of it. Know exactly what the due dates are. Know exactly what, what's going to happen before pre-trial reviews and so on. And keep being really, really annoying. And they'll want to get rid of you. Be aggressive. Uh, and that is illust illustrated um, very well by one practitioner we interviewed, a very well-known practitioner, um, look what he's had to say. Um, his personality, uh, this is something I'll refer to next week on, in the humanity lecture. I'll probably mention this again. Um, his personality was such as he, I come from a background of doing things that make me quite competitive. Um, I, I, I spent a lot of time doing martial arts. I've become very good at mind games. Uh, he, 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 this particular person is, is an insurance lawyer uh, working for an insurance based law firm and he says there are a lot of claimants who seem to run things on the basis of this is a point to exercise and every time I get one over on you I will now the difficulty with that situation is if you're going to put the boot in make damn sure you've done your laces up you can see the, the aggression is coming forward in that quote can't you you can see his character coming out and he's a hard bitten litigator I wouldn't like to tangle with him especially that's his view that it's a big fight, and I'll fight you really hard. If you're nasty to me, I'll really sort you out. And you can see a lot of macho, competitive 
attitudes in litigation coming out in the personal injury world. That word macho, and you never see that in a taught textbook. Yeah. Um, now, the aggression bit, uh, I think Hazel's taken me apart on this before now, because I think that's not quite right. I think there are, there are specialist claimant lawyers I've interviewed who will say to you, no, you don't be unnecessarily aggressive. Um, you, you look for the chinks in their armour, but you look to be accommodating. You don't run an aggressive campaign unless the occasion demands it. Uh, if they're going to be nasty to you, you might be nasty to them back. But don't start it yourself. We, we, we compromise cases. I think I'll read you a quote next week which says, from a famous uh, a claimant lawyer I know, who, who effectively said he settled his big multi-million pound award claim um, over coffee in Starbucks. Uh, um, uh, no, I wouldn't say he was a bad lawyer. <laughs> So I think, you know, you've got to be quite careful with this aggression point. I'm not too sure that it's a feature of all, all, all good lawyers. Indeed, many of them are looking for good accommodation uh, with, with the defendants and not look for that aggression. Uh, um, 